I have a degenerative spine disease and L5 has fused only on the left side and the right side is still free floating, but I do have a fusion from L5 to my hip and it does significantly affect how balanced I am in my riding. Um, I'm very grateful that I have a little mare who catches me um, a lot and has lots of forgiveness in her heart for when I can't feel my leg. Um, but just how I could be a better balanced rider for her, even though I have such limitations on the left side, that would be amazing. Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, I think the main thing to consider is that everyone has some kind of limitation or asymmetry. Uh, of course, what you're describing is, is a, is a di larger degree of difficulty, if you will. But um, I would like to point out that our nervous systems are quite genius at figuring out ways to find comfort. So just like us, our horses want to find comfort. And this is why it's important to educate them in a way that they feel confident, comfortable, happy, and that they keep coming back to work in, a, in that way, instead of it all trying to fix them or make them. And this is the same with our bodies. Um, so it looks like we have most people already trickling in. And I think what I will do is unmute Susan or ask her to unmute. I'm unmuted now. Okay, wonderful. So as Susan is talking, I'll encourage all of you to find the three dots where it says you can pin video. And then this way you'll be able to see her screen. Um, I will do the same. And then um, I will see if I can. Uh, so Susan, if you don't mind, I will introduce you. First of all, thank you very much for joining us. I'm really grateful that you're here with us. And um, how Dr. Oakley and I know each other. Um, she's been in my classes for the last three months, we figured out. And we've been having a good time exploring human movement through my Dave Thin Method and Feldenkrais classes. And um, it's been fun just chatting back and forth about the differences, the similarities, of course, hearing about her progress. And um, I think really what happened was we had a lesson about two weeks ago and Susan let me know that she felt it was a little bit the same type of feeling as it could have been if she gave that same type of work to a horse. So this is when I thought, yes, why don't we talk about this? The similarities, the differences. We were also within that class talking about the similarities of evolution and the spine and how things developed that way. But uh, I think putting these two things together for me is a wonderful way to really educate ourselves about the horses. Of course, we feel what we do and our trainers help us, but really getting an expert like Susan to help us and understand the biomechanics of a horse. Um, I think it's a wonderful opportunity to do this. So thank you again. And without further ado, please uh, say hello. Thanks, Dave. I really am excited about this opportunity to do this. You know, um, riding and helping horses is my passion. And I think the more that we learn about us and how our spines work, the more we can help our horses. Uh, so I, what I wanted to do is to go over just some of the, a little bit of the biomechanics of the spine. Don't worry, it won't be um, too awful. Physics is not my thing, so it, it will be fairly light. But I think it's really important to understand a little bit about the function. Before we can understand the function of the spine, we need to know a little bit about the structure. So. Oh, and uh, you know, in addition to the introduction there, I'm a, an equine sports medicine vet in Wellington, Florida. I'm board certified in sports medicine and rehab and also in equine practice. And I'm also a certified ISELP member. ISELP is International Society for Equine Locomotor Pathology, um, founded by Dr. Jean-Marie Dumois in France. And as they said, it was named by an anatomist, not by a marketing person. But that, you know, we really promote doing just complete workups of the horse and looking for the primary problem and and then that goes back before is how do we prevent these problems and how can we work with the biomechanics of the horse and our biomechanics to 
change these things. Uh, I've been amazed. I'm an amateur writer. Uh, I rode when I was a kid, but I never had lessons. And then I stopped writing during vet school and undergraduate due to knee problems and then back problems and this problem and that problem. And then I got back into writing about 22 years ago because one of my clients said she needed a vet who rides. So she put me on her Grand Prix horse and ruined me for the rest of my life because I thought I would never ride again. And I've been, you know, I'm very fanatical about anything that I do. So I've been trying so hard for the last 22 years to ride like you professionals. They're all so supple and loose and all look so easy. And I've been frustrated a lot by the degree of my tightness because those of us who are amateurs who get to ride one horse a day, I rode one horse a day for 20 years. Now I have the opportunity opportunity to ride two horses a day but still that's not I mean that's probably not even a warm-up for a professional and we often have jobs where we're sitting or driving a lot or computer work or things that really are, are hamper our ability to be loose and supple on our horse and I have you know do exercise programs and stretching and yoga and this and that and the other for the last you know, 15 years and then in the last three months it's been amazing to me uh, with the Feldenkrais method and I believe it's more sort of neural reprogramming because we have these movement patterns that are familiar to us and we just do when we don't even know that we do them and they're inhibiting our horse. So anyway, that's how I got into this. So I'm gonna hit the share screen button and hopefully somebody will tell me that they can see the PowerPoint when it comes up. Yes, it's working. Okay. Now, if PowerPoint gremlins will stay away and it will work. So anyway, here I wanted to talk about the biomechanics of the equine spine. And I picked this picture not because it was a pretty Arabian, but it was the mobility in the, in the neck that was just amazing. So, oh, here's the other thing I forgot to say. This is my second favorite thing to do besides ride is ultrasound. I specialize in ultrasound as well as you know, lameness. And I'm also trained in chiropractic and acupuncture. So um, if you want to see any more information and rehab uh, modalities, uh, just check out our website. So, you know, we have a human that's designed to stand up and a horse that's designed to be on four legs and we're trying to ride it. So a human only has to balance a bowling ball size object on top of the spine vertically, whereas the horse has a very, very long neck very different anatomy. We all have the same bones, they're just specialized for different needs. So the, the neck we refer to as the cervical spine. The thorax is the area where your saddle goes and where you sit the, from the withers all the way, wherever the ribs attach is the thorax. And then the lumbar area is between the ribs and the hips and the pelvis. So when we talk about the neck, it's extremely mobile huge range of motion. It's also what we call a long lever arm. So it's, it's very long. If you think of holding a flagpole with a weight at the end of it, it's much easier to hold that if it's a more upright position than it is if it's out long and low. So that's why a lot of the reasons for horses with very weak necks also look like they have a short neck because it's biomechanically easier for them to hold it in a more upright position. The other thing that I think is really important especially when we start thinking about pathology sometimes in horses with neck problems and um, osteoarthritis. If you look at the more proximal joints and the ones closer to the head, the spinal nerves come out here in these little uh, spaces. And at the top, there's huge, there's tons of room for the nerves to come out. And once we get down to where these arrows are, C4, 5, 5, 6, 6, 7, and then uh, C meaning the cervical vertebrae, and then T meaning thoracic vertebrae, C7, T1. This is where arthritis usually happens because there's a huge amount of mobility, small spaces, and then the areas for the nerves to come out are tiny down here, and they have really, really large nerves. The brachial plexus, which is the big nerve that goes down to your arm, is probably as wide as your thumb, and it comes out in all of these areas. The other thing, the reason I have the pink arrow that fascinates me is, in history. Oh, somebody's not muted, um, is that the spinal cord is really right under here and there's an area where it's not protected at all. So that's where we do our uh, cerebrospinal fluid taps if we need to do them because it's right close to the surface, which amazes me that more of them don't impale themselves there. 
So the function we have to look at is, you know, a horse is a prey animal. So they need to turn around like that Arabian on the front picture and be able to look and see who's coming to eat them and get away in a hurry. Well, we don't have anywhere near that mobility in our neck, but we're predators, so we don't really need to look behind us that much. So the top two joints, so this is the back of the skull here, and then the first vertebrae, and then between C1 and C2, they have a huge amount of rotational ability. So it's about 27 degrees of rotation. C0 is what we refer to as the skull, and C0, C1, and 107 degrees of rotation. So 73% of the rotation of the entire spine is in C1, C2. So these vertebrae are very specialized. You can see there's a lot of space area and where this um, metal rod is holding these vertebrae together, that's actually where your spinal cord is. And so again, it's intriguing because it's quite exposed. In this particular specimen, there's not as much of a curve, but the rod doesn't have a big curve in it, but there's more of a primary cervical curve and a secondary cervical curve here, which is the S curve. So when we're riding the horses, we want to be able to elevate this curve when the horse is strong and can lift his withers, and then that decreases the, the compression on the nerves in that area. So we have a good degree of lateral bending between uh, 25 and 45 degrees, I believe, of lateral bending available in these joints in the neck. So something that's long and highly mobile is often not stable. If, for example, a bulldog has huge stability. His legs are very wide apart and he's low to the ground. So he's very stable, but he can't move very fast. Whereas a greyhound is very narrow, um, but has huge mobility, but you could tip him over quite easily. So since the neck lacks stability, has so much mobility, it lacks stability. So there are over 20 pairs of muscles that hold up the neck. And in order for this horse to be aerodynamic and be able to actually move, it has to have the assistance of the nuchal ligament, which I attempted to draw here. The pink line is the, the round part of the nuchal ligament. And the blue area is the what we call laminar. It's more um, fan-like that attaches to C2, 3, and 4. And the nuchal ligament, just like the ligaments in the superficial flexor tendon in the lower limb, a lot of their purpose is, is to store energy. So when the horse's head goes down, it's like stretching a rubber band. And when you stretch a rubber band and let go of the rubber band, it snaps back. And so that gives the energy back. So the nuchal ligament stores so much energy that it accomplishes 55% of the work of raising the head at the walk, 33% at the trot, and 31% at the canter. Numbers don't matter, but I just find it fascinating. You know, it's a very important structure. It's not the only structure in the neck, but it is a very important structure. So in the thorax, which starts with the, the withers here, and that's where our, you know, our saddle sits behind the withers, the thorax is defined as the area that has the ribs attached. And the first thoracic vertebrae looks like a little shark fin. Um, these are called the dorsal spinous processes, dorsal like a dorsal fin on a shark, so on the top. And uh, that makes up what the withers are. It's just the length of the spinous process. And then we have all the ribs attached. So the thorax shouldn't be mobile or we kind of be in trouble. We wouldn't breathe very well. We have to have stability in the, for in the thorax. And so the ribs are attached both at the spine and then on the sternum. So you have some flexion and extension, but each particular joint doesn't have that much lateral rotation. And the other thing that's really critical to understand, especially in the thorax and the lumbar area, but also in the neck, is that bending is coupled with rotation. It's not possible to have lateral bending of the spine without rotation of each individual vertebrae. So that's kind of important when we think about how the thorax rotates and how that affects our saddle fit and et cetera. It's interesting that there's more lateral bending at T14 to T18. That's about where your saddle sits. And there's six to 10 degrees bending per joint there, where is Whereas underneath the shoulder blade here, you have one to two degrees per joint. So the other thing that I find fascinating um, that I hadn't thought about until I took the chiropractic course is, is the ribs. Of course, the ribs are there to provide support for lungs because otherwise we wouldn't be able to fill our, you know, the diaphragm wouldn't work to fill our lungs with air. But there are 
three joints on every vertebrae on each side, so that's six per vertebrae, where the ribs attach. So when you think about it, if a horse at rest, forget working, but at rest, generally has 12 breaths per minute times 60 minutes an hour times 24 hours a day, that means that horse breathes 17,000 times a day. I found that amazing. So you can have some pathology sometimes in the ribs, but it's important to me, I think about, okay, how tight are we tightening our girths sometimes? You know, I have a, my PRE is very round and I have to tighten the girth that tight or the saddle slips to the side. But on the horses with good withers, you know, we don't want the saddle to bounce, but I see a lot of saddles that are super, super tight. And just think about how many times these horses need to breathe and be able to move. So when we get to the spine, which is the lower back, the purpose of the lumbar spine is to support the abdominal viscera, in other words, the horse's guts. Okay, the horse has a huge amount of weight in their uh, intestines, and that has to be supported by something. And so that's the purpose of these. These are called transverse processes. This is the dorsal spinal process that goes up, and the transverse processes are on the side. And then the muscles all attach to these processes, and that's what suspends the massive weight of the guts. So we can suspend the guts, but then we don't get much lateral bending because you see these, you bend just a little bit and these processes touch. Some horses, the last two are fused as well, which limits the bending even more. So most of the bending is in the lumbosacral joint, which is the joint between the lumbar spine and the sacrum, which is attaching to the pelvis. The pelvis is, is not in this particular picture. So we have a, a really large range of motion in flexion and extension there. Not so much lateral bending, but a lot of rotation. So hopefully this video will play. Oh no, it played last night. Oh well. So you guys should go, just go Google on YouTube, or go to YouTube and MyBridge, Edward MyBridge did some of the first videos ever. And this is from 1878. And it's just one or two strides of this horse that repeats over and over and over. But you can see that most of the movement of the spine is in the lumbosacral area. Unfortunately, we have PowerPoint gremlins that tend to attack your videos all the time. So I'm sorry I couldn't play that. So I also wanted to talk about the sacroiliac joint because everybody's heard of it. Everybody talks about it. My horse is sore in the sacroiliac. And it's just interesting. It's a flat surface that joins the, the sacrum, which is what connects the spine, it continues the spine down to the, to the pelvis. And it's a very flat, fibrous joint that doesn't actually have joint fluid. And it's stabilized only by ligaments. And it actually has a really low range of motion. This is your sacroiliac joint, whereas your lumbosacral joint is right in front of it. So it's only about an inch away. So a lot of times when we say we're injecting the sacroiliac, we're also injecting the lumbosacral joint, which may be the source of the problem. So the function of the sacroiliac joint is to transfer power from the hind limbs through the, the spine, through the back. And there's huge stresses on the sacroiliac joint. So I made this slide just because you know, we're always taught that you, know, you should bend equally on a 20 meter circle. And um, it's really interesting that it, that, that's not actually possible for the horse physically. This black line represents the spine. Um, should be sort of in thirds here, but it may not be exactly. But in the cervical or the neck area, so each vertebrae has between 25 and 45 degrees of lateral bending available to it, which really explains why it's so easy for us amateurs to overbend our horse. The thoracic spine, in the beginning of it, there's only two degrees per vertebrae. Once we get down to T14 to 18, there's about 10 degrees per vertebrae available. And then in the lumbar spine, with rotation, there is 12 degrees towards the lumbosacral joint, but you know, it's only between four and 12. I didn't want to make a diagram so detailed that I put it for every vertebrae, but I just found this kind of fascinating because we're all taught oh, the horse should bend evenly on the circle. Well, that's not a physical possibility for the horse. Fortunately for us, the horse has a better range of lateral bending 
T14 to T18, which is where we sit and where our leg goes. So when we say the horse bends around the leg, really we're accessing that part of the spine. So I just found this interesting in explaining why it's so hard to get that even bend. So with, you know, everybody's horse has a back, not everybody, but a lot of horses have back issues. And one of my favorite lines is every top line tells a story. So obviously there can be underlying problems, or different things going on, but very often you can tell how the horse has been worked by looking at the back musculature. So what we want is we want a nice smooth curve that has well-developed muscles when we look across the horse's back here. And we prefer not to have something that looks like a church steeple. The horse in the bottom picture is 25 years old, so he's allowed to have this top line. He's now 30 something and um, he still looks pretty good. So, you know, we want to look for muscle atrophy, stiffness, mobility. Um, also, behavior problems can be a big sign of pain. So, I want to talk about mobilization of the neck. I see a lot of people doing carrot stretches, and carrot stretches are good, but I think it's really important that you know what you're actually stretching. So, if you want to stretch the lower neck, the horse's ears need to be level. And so this horse, that's his range of motion. That's as far as he can go without tip tilting his head. And then when you, once you start the head tilt, then you're getting rotation here. And the spine has a huge ability to do rotation. Now that's not necessarily bad, but you need to know what your what is your intent, what is your purpose of that. And the carrot stretches when they touch their hip, that can be very good for their core muscles and all sorts of things. But I, I think we should just think about what we are actually moving. As the horse has flexion and extension, lateral flexion is, is lateral bending, which of course in people we would call the side bend. And then, you know, are we getting lateral bending or are we getting rotation? So this is an interesting video. I'm just going to show a withers lift on this horse. And I'll, I'll show it a couple of times so you can watch it. And look at the window in the background. It just happened to be conveniently uh, place there so that we can have a, a marker to watch. And then watch the horse's whole spine and his neck. This horse is very mobile. So I'm gonna lift his withers and he goes way, way, way up there. Oops, sorry, I thought I had edited that. I'm really not mad in that picture. <laughs> so that horse there, oh, well, we can't keep looking at that. I'll have to start it and stop it. So that, that has a really good range of motion. And just as a little aside, this is not a talk on pathology or anything, but you know, horses with kissing spines have a lot of pain in that area and they cannot lift like this. Also, when I do this lift, or if you try it on your own horse, I, I don't do it straight on the midline because there's an acupuncture point there that can be very painful if the horse has ulcers. So I go a little bit to one side, a little bit to each side and scratch them to ask them to lift. And I think it's a really good thing to do before you ride and just kind of remind the horse that it's possible for him to go there. And this also, Dave and I were talking the other night about the saddle fit too. So it's really important when you fit your saddles to have your saddle fitter, I mean, Ideally, you want to see the horse, ride the horse, and see the horse move under saddle, because if he's just fit while he's standing there, it, then you don't have the same fit when you're riding. But what I do is I lift my horse like this for the saddle fitter while he's standing in the barn for him to fit there, because we want to fit the horse so he has room to come up. And if he doesn't ever go there, he's not going to know how. So this is, I didn't get a good video of this, but this is, um, Lumbosacral, and this horse doesn't have a whole lot of motion here. But if you look at the background, again, we happen to have a door in the background that we can use as a marker. So if you look at the pink arrow on the left versus the pink arrow on the right, you can see that he really has moved a bit. And a lot of that flexion is in the lumbosacral area. So if you look at the outline of his back, it's quite different. So our backs do the same types of movements that the horses do, flexion, extension, rotation, and lateral bending. So here's another way we test lateral bending, and this is a, in, in chiropractic, which is technically called spinal manipulation because chiropractic refers to human only. We do what's called a motion palpation exam. So we go through the horse 
and check every joint and see if there is movement in here. And this is a movement called wag the horse where you just stabilize one side of the ribs and gently pull on the tail and see it should oscillate all the way up to the head if the horse doesn't have any blockages. And this was what made me think about in one of Dave's lessons last week or whichever week it was, where we were lying there and, and trying to move, feel each vertebrae and then move each vertebrae a little bit to the side. And I was like, oh, there's no way. What are you, crazy? I can't do this. Um, and then I just let that go, and I was like, wow. And I'm like, that is exactly the subtlety of movement that I've trained myself to have for the chiropractic and the acupuncture. And so doing these lessons has enabled me to try to transfer that to my riding, too, so we can learn to be more subtle in our own movements and not so rigid that we can feel a whole lot more. And the horses go totally different, very much more free. The other thing I think is always important to do when I'm examining a horse, usually I'm examining for a performance issue or sometimes lameness, but we always always want to watch the horse move too. Because how the horse stands, the posture is very important to observe. You know, are they resting one leg or is you know the head up in the air and the back way down? Or what is the horse, what is his preferred posture? How does he want to stand. But then we all also need to watch the movement, you know, and we walk them up and down and especially with the chiropractic exams, or spinal manipulation exams, we, we watch the horse at the walk a lot. You see different things at the walk, the trot and the canter. So they're all useful. And then I always like to see the horse, if he behaves on the lunge line, free as in no side reins or anything like that because I want to see how the horse wants to move on his own whereas when you put the side reins on them they know how they're supposed to move and they're trained to move uh, so we can get a little more information there and then under saddle is really important because there are a lot of things that are not visible anywhere but under saddle and then watching the horse in his sport specific exercise I just picked these two pictures here because I thought they were a really interesting example of how the horse can use or not use his spine. This was a horse at uh, Hits in Ocala, I think, years back. And I uh, just thought the horse had just beautiful movement over the top and he has a nice extension of the spine. And in this case, the rider's spine kind of matches the horse. It doesn't always, but in this case. And then the second picture, this poor soul definitely has an issue because he cannot extend his lumbar spine at all. So where the issue is, that's a whole other story. It could be anywhere in the hind end. But I think it's really important to watch the horse move and watch their posture. And then also how um, the horse's attitude is. I mean, that little one on the bottom looks like he's gonna say, ouch, when he lands. So again, how to recognize these things. Neck pain, I mean, if the horse will move his head, you know, that's really obvious, but sometimes they're more subtle. I don't know who this horse is. This came off of Shutterstock, uh, but it is a very interesting picture because you see huge atrophy in the lower neck. The horse is big and bulging up here, which if you remember the picture of the spine, they're very, there's nothing to stabilize these uh, vertebrae up here other than the muscles. So these muscles are working really, really, really hard uh, you know, this is splenius and a bunch of other muscles. And a lot of horses, you'll see a big old lump right here where it's a big knot, a big spasm trying to support the neck. So what's happened in this particular horse is he has no muscles here. There the, don't worry about the names of the muscles, but there's, there's absolutely no rhomboid. There shouldn't be a dip in front of the withers. Um, you, there's no serratus. There's just a big hole here. So there's nothing for this horse to hold his neck up with except for the upper neck muscles, which are not the correct muscles to be using. Which as an aside, I think I find that a lot in my own body where I'm using muscles that are not supposed to be working because the other ones are turned off. And this horse is, I don't know what the story is on this particular horse, but it's very common in these cases if you have osteoarthritis in the lower neck. Uh, where I showed how close those areas where the nerves will come out, it will actually compress the nerves that go to these muscles. And that's one reason you can get atrophy. So it could also be the way the horse is ridden. There are a lot of different things, but if you have a horse with a neck problem, it's very common to see that kind of atrophy. So I'm clearly not gonna talk about all the pathology and not neurologic problems either, but I just thought that was a very interesting picture, interesting illustration. So back pain too, again, back pain can be primary, can be secondary, can be from a back problem or can be from a hind limb problem. This horse here had huge atrophy 
in this area and very you see the very sharp spine and I wasn't able to get the other picture on of the after picture after we treated it with a functional electrical stimulation after treating all the other horses looking at the big picture uh, and three months later that horse was as round as the picture I showed of the round back so if you're interested in this case if you go to the website it's on one of the cases and then um, sacroiliac lumbosacral pain you know that's very very common again we have to figure out is it primary or is it secondary so I think my next slide has it. So, but one thing is a big take home for me though, is a hunter's bump is never normal. This horse has two issues. This horse has a little bit of a roach back and it has the hunter's bump, which a hunter's bump isn't a thing. It's a lack of muscle. So you see atrophy here at the origin of the hamstrings, which means I can't tell you where the horse is laying, but I can tell you that that horse is not pushing off because he's not using the proper muscles that he should be using. And even though he's confirmationally has a little bit of a roach back, there's still huge muscle atrophy here. So when I see these things, I just think it's a big arrow from the sky pointing down, hey, 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 look, you've got something going on here in the hind end. Could be back, could be further down, could be secondary, could be primary. But when you see a hunter's bump, there's usually, there's usually something you can do to help that horse. So, that's just a little tour of the spine. Needless to say, we didn't talk about any muscles and I didn't want to get too um, crazy with it today or we could be here for three days. But I found these pictures really, really interesting. And again, I don't know who these people are. They came off the Shutterstock or iStock photo, one or the other. But it's an issue that, you know, everybody talks about saddle fit and saddle fit is very important. But who's crooked here? Is it the horse, the rider, or the saddle? Now, Dr. Sue Dyson, who's one of the most famous lameness vets in the world in um, England, she's published numerous studies on um, saddle slip and that saddle slip can be associated with lameness where they took horses that had saddle slip problems and they had very subtle lameness issues and they blocked them and the saddle stopped slipping. So it's not always just the saddle and certainly our imbalances affect it tremendously because if we are crooked, then the horse is going to be crooked. So it's always the question for me, who's more crooked, me or the horse? So with going through the Feldenkrais stuff, I've been able to become much more aware of my issues and to be able to do something about it. And actually, interestingly enough, I think the biggest thing for me is I'm able to isolate my movements and just move one body part, whereas before I couldn't. Uh, so I think it's all a combination, you know, we you know, have to, fix our own body as well as the horse and there's a veterinarian that's a big challenge for me because not every that's not my place to tell the person they have an issue but it affects their horse i looked at a horse a couple of weeks ago from a, a, a good rider but she had some physical problems a couple of years ago and uh it was very interesting the difference in the saddle from side to side. So I think we can look at our saddle problems. I've had that in the past too, where if you, know, if you have one seat print imprint more on the saddle than the other, then that's saying that we have an imbalance that we need to fix ourselves. So anyway, that's the end of my part. And at the end, we're, Dave and I are happy to take questions. And if you don't wanna stay for that, then that's no problem. But I'm now going to turn it over to Dave. Dave, I can't hear you. I don't know if anybody else can. Are you, oh, there, you, there you go. I'm back. So first of all, thank you so much for that presentation. Um, you know, wonderful. All of the slides had so rich with information. And I know as horse people in general, we want to help our horses. So thank you so much for providing us that opportunity to learn some things that will help our horses. And then, of course, if our horses are happy, we're happier. Um, so I would actually, before we continue, uh, if anybody needs to just get up and move around, I would encourage you to do that now. Um, we're gonna be doing a lesson. These are lessons. That's the reason why we call it a lesson is because we're gonna be learning something. So looking at this picture, I'm assuming most people would love to learn which side they would like to bend a little bit more to the left or to the right if left alone. You know, all things being equal, horses, saddles, 
which way does each particular rider tend to lean. So if you look at both spines here, you'll see uh, the letter C. So by that, if we look at the first picture on the left, we see uh, actually both are doing the same thing. So the saddle slides to the right, and therefore the right leg of the rider becomes long. The left leg sort of pulls upwards, and the shoulder goes down to meet the hip and the leg on that left side. The head would normally also want to do some kind of side bending, as we see in the first picture. The rider looks like he's probably going to be turning right uh, after landing. As you can see that uh, from the top of the head and from the ear, it looks like he would be looking to the right. But nothing else is saying about going right in that case. So right away, we see that there's an issue. Um, you know, do we want to go left or right? The first rider looks like she, her intention is to go left. So this is as unique it is to every situation. What I'll point out is that when we turn, as Susan mentioned, rotation and side bend go hand in hand. So if we rotate in this plane, so to the left or to the right, if I'm not pinned, you can pin me. Um, if you rotate as if to look behind you to the left or to the right, there will be some side bending happening as well. So what, what it actually dictates is there's something called automatic rotation that uh, when you side bend, there would be an automatic rotation. You can look it up if you're interested. That's the official uh, anatomical term. But what I would like to point out is that even though the books will tell you that when you side bend, there'll be rotation in one direction, you can side bend, for example, to the left and rotate either to the left or to the right. So um, what this means is that if you're riding, for example, and you all of a sudden collapse, so sitting to the outside, going left, short on the left, you could turn your shoulders to the right and you could also turn your shoulders to the left. So those are options that are available. And then of course, we also touched in already on the various places of the spine. So uh, we talked about the cervical spine and the horse. So we also have a natural curve to the cervical spine and we have a natural curve to the lumbar. Those two curves, Again, the anatomy books tell us it's different from person to person. And I'd rather not say that there must be a correct way, but I guess the ideal would be that those two curves mirror each other. So this is where it's often referred to as a double S because the middle of the back, actually surprising for a lot of riders, goes the other way. So it's a bit of a kyphotic curve. It's almost as if you had withers and your withers are coming up. Uh, of course, as riders, we'd like to go into extension. What that means is it's a little bit like we're looking up or arching our back. And in order to do that, a lot of things happen in the pelvis and the vertebrae one at a time will articulate so that you're able to arch, sort of like Venetian blinds. Um, back to other parts of you know, the neck. and The neck is able to do all kinds of things, lots of ability to do whatever we want. And often riders don't have, or humans in general, lose rotation or movement in the thoracic vertebrae. So if we have trouble really coming up when we want to, usually the way around that is to come to some kind of movement of side to side rotation. And then it's a little bit more available. The last thing that I'd like to talk about before we experiment through feeling is that a lot of riders feel that when they turn, there's rotation happening in the lower back. So in the lumbar of the human, there's almost no movement. So what that means is, hmm, where are we rotating from? So rotation starts in the thoracic vertebrae, and as I said, the neck can do basically whatever we want to do. In general, most people, feel that they're rotating from their lower back and that can cause back problems. So the reason they feel that is down with the, in the lower back area, there's side bend. So when side bend is available, when you turn, there'll be that rotation with the side bend. 
which will give you the impression that everything is spiraling and turning um, in order to turn and rotate. Back to that idea, rotation and side bend as being different options. We don't have to turn everything to the left or everything to the right. It's possible for us, for example, the books tell us to canter. Your outside leg is back, inside leg is forward. Therefore, your pelvis is turned towards the outside and the shoulders turn to the inside. And you do this without collapsing. So therefore, I think it's important to try to feel the different possibilities, the options, not get obsessive, obsessive about it because um, it becomes impossible to be spontaneous. And that's what we're after in this work. So I'd like to invite everyone, please, to um, find a mat if you have one. Please turn your cameras on. And uh, you can do the lesson sitting if you wish, but I think you'll get more out of it if you uh, do everything laying down. If laying down on the ground is not possible because of where you are, of course, try to sit maybe on the edge of a chair, something relatively flat. You can also do it standing. So I will go through all of that and I'll wait just a couple of minutes for everyone to get comfortable. And I will um, need to ask Susan to make me the host again so that and to stop sharing. How do I do that? <laughs> okay, I will try to see. I if can I stop share. I don't know how to make you the host. Okay, you go ahead and I will. Uh, I'll just stop share.